I'm Leslie Rohde with AskTheLawyers.com. Today, our guest is Brian Chase, managing partner and trial lawyer of Biznar Chase. He's a former president of the Consumer Attorneys of California. That's a group that is dedicated to creating awareness about product safety. He and his team have uh, collected more than $500 million in settlements and verdicts for their clients. And a recent case Brian handled was an auto defect case. It resulted in a $24.7 million verdict for the client. He's here today to help all of us understand what to do if we've been in a car accident where an auto defect may have caused or contributed to that wreck. Thank you so much, Brian, for being with us today. Well, thank you, Leslie. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate I, it. I want to start with, um, help us understand the difference in a car accident case that one that might be caused by an auto uh, defective part and just a regular uh, run-of-the-mill car accident. Yeah, well, that's a great question, Leslie. You know, typically when we think of an auto accident, uh, that's where someone, you know, cuts you off and hits you or you get rear-ended or someone pulls out of a driveway and hits you. So you have a driver that's negligent. So your typical auto accident is where two people are in an accident or more and somebody was negligent. So you're really suing that person because they were negligent and caused an accident. Now, uh, the difference between that and an auto defect case would be if you are in an accident um, and something goes wrong with the car that causes an injury to you that you wouldn't have had but for a defect. So let's say, you know, in an auto accident, somebody could rear-end you and had a part not broken in your car, you might not have been that hurt. But because a part broke in the car that caused the injury more so than the person that was negligent in hitting you, you would have an auto defect case and you wouldn't want to sue the auto manufacturer. So I was going to ask that. Who, would, who is uh, responsible in an auto defect case? Who could be responsible? Okay, so there are multiple people um, in the chain of distribution that are potentially responsible in an auto defect case. So if, if you're in an accident and your car rolls over and the roof crushes in and that causes you an injury, um, you can sue the auto manufacturer um, because they would be responsible because they put the car on the market. Now you may have something wrong with your seatbelt that allowed you to get hurt in that rollover case, in which case, while the manufacturer would be responsible for that defective seatbelt, or if an airbag didn't deploy, you would also be able to file a lawsuit against the supplier of those parts. So the manufacturer is ultimately always responsible, but you can also always sue a supplier of somebody that made a defective airbag or made a defective seat belt, defective brakes, things of that nature. I heard some examples there that you gave us, but could you give us maybe some other examples of the things that you see in your practice there in terms of defective parts? Sure, and there's there's a whole range of them. But the things that are in the news a lot lately have been the Takata airbags, because there's been you know millions and millions of vehicles recalled because of that. So that would be an example where you've got a defective airbag, Takata in this case. But those Takata airbags are in Hondas, Fords, Chevys. So you would also be able to sue the manufacturers there uh, of the vehicle. But the types of defects we see are every everywhere from vehicles that roll over when they shouldn't roofs that crush in and cause a head injury or a paralyzing injury when they shouldn't, airbags that deploy when they shouldn't or don't deploy when they should, seat belt buckles fail. Um, when people get rear-ended at say 30, 40 miles an hour, their seat can go backwards and break. And then you actually have no seat behind you and you end up in the back seat. I've got clients that have broken their neck and become quadriplegics from things like that. There are just, just, you know, Cars getting hit and exploding. Gas tanks aren't supposed to explode anymore since the 70s and the Fort Pinto cases. Mm -hmm. So there are just a whole host of, of things that can go wrong in cars in accidents. A huge variety, it sounds like. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the recall, and, and I was curious about that as well. Does, it, does a part have to be either recalled by the manufacturer or possibly even the government at sometimes for a person to be able to sue for that case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question because a lot of people get that mixed up and absolutely not. Okay. You know, all these defects, not all, most of these defects that I'm talking about right now involve vehicles on the road that are not recalled. You absolutely do not need to have a vehicle recalled to sue for an auto defect. And just because a car is on the road and not recalled does not mean it is not defective. You know, from, the, from my view of the world and all the cases I do literally across the country, there are millions and millions and millions of vehicles on the road that have deadly and dangerous defects in them. 
um, that under the right circumstances can catastrophically kill you or injure you or a loved one or family member. So you have an accident, something happens to you. What are some of the things that will tell you if it was caused by a defective part? I mean, how do you know? Yeah, um, you know, the, the, the shorter answer is I've been doing this for over 20 years. And so I've become real good at identifying auto defect cases early on with just typically a traffic collision report, you know, a medical record. So I understand what the injury is and some pictures of the vehicle. So typically I can analyze a case in 15, 20 minutes and know nine times out of 10, if it's no case, a good case or an average case. Every now and then you'll come across something that's unique that you just can't tell by pictures because it's not what I call a typical defect I see every day, day in and day out. So under those circumstances, I've got a team of experts I work with and I have to give them some more information so they can do their homework uh, to help me figure out uh, you know, whether or not a defect manifested itself and caused the injury. And you've been doing this for a while, as you say, but the average consumer who may be in an accident may not know uh, and need to contact a lawyer. How does a person go about choosing a lawyer in one of these cases? Yeah, so that's, that's another great question. Um, you really need to hire an attorney that specializes in auto defect cases. I can't tell you how many times over the last 20 plus years I've had clients come to me where one or more lawyers told them they had no case. Um, Good lawyers, well-meaning lawyers, but just don't understand auto defects because they were generic personal injury attorneys. So nothing against them. And I have gotten millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars for these clients over the years on quote unquote, no auto defect cases because a lawyer gave them the wrong advice. So my first suggestion, anybody that thinks the defect may be involved is find a lawyer that specializes in and does auto defect cases, not just the popular lawyer in town, who may be a great attorney and they might be fine on the case, but you're better off finding somebody that does these cases, has been doing them for a long time, knows what they're doing. And one thing I tell all clients or prospective clients, regardless of if it's a defect case or an injury case, you wanna find a lawyer that's trying cases. You know, you want somebody with verdicts, someone that knows their way around a courtroom because only then can you hopefully avoid the ultimate trial and get a really good settlement. But when the uh, auto industry knows you don't try cases or if in, uh, insurance industry knows you don't try cases, you're not gonna maximize the value of that case for your client. So find somebody that specializes in it and find somebody that tries cases routinely. Good advice. If, if a person would contact your group, your firm, what can someone expect? What can some of the steps happen there? Yeah, well, we, we really, you know, we've got, I think in the last seven or eight years now, best places to work in Orange County. So we have a really good team of people here and a really good culture. We really, people overuse, I think in the workplace, we're a family, but we really are a family here. And when you become a client, you're, you're one of our family members. And we pride ourselves in, and on our mission statement, we pride ourselves on um, giving a client superior client representation. And that's what we strive for. So if you call us, from right the minute you get the intake person on the phone, um, they'll ask you all the right questions, give you the information you need. Uh, if they can't answer the questions, they'll get me or one of my associates or partners on the phone to answer your questions. And we will make sure right at the get-go, you feel welcomed, uh, you feel um, that your questions are being answered and answered adequately. And if we can't answer them then, we'll figure it out and call you right back and answer it for you. Because uh, we want you to be confident in us. Because you, you, know, you need to trust the attorney you hire. You know, Brian, hearing you give some of the examples of defective auto parts and some cases of, it has to be, I would imagine, very satisfying for you personally to watch your clients uh, go through these and actually come out with some sort of a result that is a good thing for them and quality of life. Oh, it, you know, I'm one of the few lawyers that actually went to law school to do personal injury cases and I wanted to specialize in products liability. Mm -hmm. I didn't just fall into it after working for an insurance company for five years. Um, it's, it's been a passion of mine since before law school and, and on my law school application, I said two things. I wanted my life's work to matter and have a positive substantive impact on other people's lives. So when I have a client come to me that have lost a child or a spouse or they're in a wheelchair, um, to go after the responsible party and get justice for this client and make their life better 
get whatever it is financially I can do to ease all the burdens on that family, it is tremendously satisfying. And I feel like, you know, my mission statement uh, and going to law school has been accomplished. So very, very satisfying. Thanks, Brian. Th thank you for all you do. And thank you for spending this time giving us some uh, valuable information. Well, thank you so much for having me on the program. I really appreciate it. All right, thanks. And I'm Leslie Rohde. We thank you for watching. We're with AskTheLawyers.com, where you can choose a lawyer that lawyers choose.